Welcome to part two of our webinar series on Mastering 21st Century Enterprise Risk Management. This week we discuss Getting It Right, Implementing Risk Management. The call will be recorded for later replay and copies of the slide deck will be made available. Implementing the right enterprise risk management system can mean turning compliance and risk management from an obligatory overhead into a valuable strategic performance and management tool available throughout all levels of management. You'll hear from Greg Carroll, founder and technical director at FastTrack, an enterprise compliance firm based in the Gold Coast. Greg has 30 years of experience implementing governance, risk management and compliance systems. Today, Greg looks at the secrets to successfully implementing management systems in large enterprise organizations and how best to achieve the cultural change vital for your project's success. Greg? Thanks, Fiona. Um, I'd like to start by telling you a little tale um, but it might have a familiar ring to uh, probably most of you. So after years of having to make do with uh, a manual risk management system, spending your time fighting fires and doing post-mortems on one failure or another, the board has finally approved the state-of-the-art ERM system. Due to you being such a vocal advocate, you've been appointed as the sponsor for the project. At last, you can show them how it should be done. A week later, after the initial euphoria and kudos settles down, you start thinking about what needs to be done. Thoughts start creeping into the back of your mind about which was the last successful computer implementation you can remember and what happened to Joe who oversaw the QMS debacle. Then it hits you. You are responsible. With 40% of IT projects classed as unsuccessful and 25% failing to produce a result at all, your future prospects aren't looking that great at the moment. Firstly, firstly, you think, well, I'll just buy IBM or SAP. Can't go wrong with that. But then you remember reading something about the Queensland Health IBM disaster. Okay, so you get stuck into it. You hire consultants to identify your requirements and you uh, get IT to source and evaluate suppliers. You select a large enterprise firm established and uh, to implement, implement the solution because they had a very impressive presentation. IT appoints a business analyst to liaise with the supplier's business analyst to ensure that they can interpret the consultant's IT speak. And then they hire a project manager who has a strong history in PRINCE2 methodology. All set then, ready to go. The project starts and within a month you start receiving good charts and graphs, all on track. Two months pass and variations start coming in. The delivery date slips six weeks and the costs increase by 5%, but still all okay. IT sets up a test environment under formal change controls and contracts professional testers. Another two months pass, more charts and reports, still all on track. But IT inform you that they need to upgrade the hardware and comms to run the new software, and that's going to come out of your budget. The supplier produces a new version and you decide to take it because it's got some great features. One month later you're informed that there's a three month slippage because the new version and new hardware requires reconfiguration of the work done. Oops. The IT manager resigns and takes your business analyst with him. The supplier finally provides the, a prototype for testing but now you've lost your internal Oracle expertise and uh, you need to contract in somebody else. Another month lost and more cost. Testers finally give the system a big workout producing 25 pages of fixes, half of which though the supplier rejects out of hand saying it's out of scope. By the time the changes that are agreed are made and retested there's another three months gone. But finally user acceptance testing commences but then all hell breaks loose. Staff don't find the system usable, the functionality doesn't really work in the way your business does. The amount of input slows processing and increases manpower costs. IT informs you that you really need an additional BI module, whatever that is, to get the analysis you expected. The economy contracts and the CFO calls for a review of the project. It finds that the project is now nine months overdue, 50% over budget 
with little justifiable additional benefits from the original proposal. It's all starting to feel like Groundhog Day and you start noticing that you're not being included in meetings like you were in the past. Where did it all go wrong? Well, the simple answer is you tra uh, I'm treating it like an IT project, not a change management issue. It's amazing how successful business people with long records of success in their business suddenly abdicate management of IT projects to an industry with such a poor track record. Success depends on approaching the implementation from a change management perspective, not treating it as an IT project. In our tale, the problems really started with the selection of the system and the supplier. For this, I'd refer you to our 10 essentials guides, which you can um, download from our website. Next, the mistake was using consultants to define requirements. Just as an executive cannot outsource strategic planning, you must do your own requirements and scenario analysis. The 80-20 rule says that 80% of things you do, you do regularly, while 20% are exceptions. But it's those, that 20% of exceptions that will cause you 80% of your problems in the future. Your internal staff are the best at identifying these exceptions. Plus, it's also a good way to get them to take up ownership of the system. Next problem was with project management. The biggie here is to choose a people person for your project manager. Since project management is 80% art and 20% administration, the art is managing a wide range of people with competing goals, egos and work ethics. Every project will involve politics and lazy workers, some not interested and even some that uh, want the whole thing to fail. The challenge is you have to get them to work together. An even bigger mistake is the way that project risk is treated. It rarely is anything more than just a ticking of a box. Generic risk assessments, no mitigation planning and no periodic review make most project risk assessments a bureaucratic waste of time. I don't know how much time I've spent and wasted in costly project meetings discussing excuses and delays due to unforeseen circumstances. Risk management should include critical control points and mitigation planning and they need to be reviewed continuously, not just completed and filed. It's really not unusual to lose people in a project or throughout the course of a project or to experience IT changes or, or other types of contract variations. Risk management is supposed to be about preparing for identifying and handling such events effectively. Finally, there's the issue of project stakeholders involvement. You have to have all stakeholders involved from the start. Sometimes software vendors aren't allowed to talk to direct end users. Other times IT isn't consulted until the point of installation. Big mistake. Having skin in the game ensures that all players are going to equally be held responsible and accountable for the success or failure of the project. Another thing is instead of uh, uh, having a specific project sponsor appointed, which just actively encourages internal politics, I recommend you set up a team of senior management to oversee the project, all being accountable for success just the way a board um, is accountable for the, a company's performance. With implementation, the current best practice in implementing a project is what's referred to as an agile method, where progress is released weekly, giving the clients and users the opportunity to review the progress early in the project. This helps identify system flaws sooner when they can be fixed easier. Long ago IBM figured out that it cost 20 times more to change something in the delivery phase than it does in the setup phase. So of course the, your vendors are going to resist any change once they start delivering. Remember if users don't like a system it will be considered a failure no matter how good it is. Then we've got the length of the project. Any general will tell you that it, uh, the key to a quick victory is good planning and preparation. But once fighting commences, it comes down to flexibility and quick reactions. So plan for a short project and prepare for possible outcomes. But ensure that the project structure is such that it allows fast reporting and quick decision making. Plan for a project of less than 12 months. Six is even better. Don't try to build a, a perfect solution from day one. My recommendation is to plan for three projects one which handles the first 80% of your requirements, the second which will refine those requirements after you can see how they really pan up, play out in the real world, and the third is to deal with the final 20% once you have the basics well grounded. Don't change your requirements until the, that third refinement phase, regardless of how good it might be. 
Just develop a workaround and put off the change until that last phase. Testing and training. Well, there's books written on testing and there's an industry built around it. But in the end, it's up to you to ensure that the solution will handle your business requirements. This means first knowing your business and second knowing that the solution will work within your business and the unique processes that occur. So don't outsource testing. Doing so removes a, a vital step of integrating that new software or system into the specific way your business operates. Unless a vendor is totally incompetent, the problems you're going to find are going to be with the exceptions or the handling of the micro detail. Develop test plans as you develop your requirements. That way you can focus on the variations and exceptions and build in real world problems. With training, success is judged on what the system does for the business. This in turn is a result of how well it's used by those who drive it. Training should invest as much time in selling the personal benefits to users as it does in telling them what buttons to push. Show users how the system can reduce conflict or eliminate boring work or enhance their careers. Then target the training to common role types within the organisation so that those types of benefits be leveraged across the people who are going to use it. Change is always hard, so the idea is to motivate early adopters first. Find some champions. Um, good and modern enterprise uh, systems are not just a computerization of uh, existing manual or uh, legacy type systems. They generally provide a quantum leap in the process or the delivery and they can revolutionize an industry. Consider the, the banking industry over the last 10 years and how people bank. It's all changed dramatically. You'll be surprised what really is doable with uh, IT these days. But to achieve it, you've got to be prepared for big changes internally. So what's the best way of affecting that change? The simple answer is, your employees have to adopt the system as an endemic part of their job. The rest you can find in a book. So how do you achieve that elusive end? Well, anyone involved in change management knows that changing people's behaviour requires that the individual sees personal benefits. So get out and talk to your staff. Learn what's important to them and then try leveraging those motivations. Once you've grasped this, the process of uh, achieving success is really straightforward. First of all, identify your staff motivations, then pick the compliance frameworks elements that support those motivations. Involve the staff in implementing those elements, give them feedback on the progress of the report and then reward and publicise the success. The secret here is to forget the formal frameworks and implement the employee issues first. It's much easier to introduce the more pedantic elements of uh, frameworks or compliance frameworks uh, once you've got a group of um, core supporters and advocates. So what I've done next is I've had a look at the 2010 employee survey from SEEK, Australia's largest employment website. And through that uh, survey, they identified the top motivations of employees. And so what I've done is I've gone through and I've tied those personal motivations to different elements within a, a compliance framework. So I'll go through them reasonably quickly. Number one and two in the uh, employee motivations was how they get on with their co-workers and the work environment. So do you take advantage of this, form small teams and look for individual elements out of the framework based on their interest. The key here is to empower uh, people to improve their own work environment and having them um, set their own GRC goals. The easiest thing is get them to start with a risk assessment of their area or processes. Number four on the list was um, variety and content of work. There was an April 2013 Harvard uh, Business Review article entitled Happiest People Pursue Most Difficult Problems, which basically suggests that the key to job satisfaction is involving staff in problem solving. That's probably one of the greatest tools that you can use in putting in uh, risk or compliance systems. Get them heavily involved in mitigation or improvement teams. Get them to do the um, scenario analysis. They'll enjoy it and you'll get more out of them. Next we've got hours of work. Obviously people aren't happy with long hours, so consider the reason for those long hours. 
Commonly it's due to firefighting or rework. So match implementation tasks that are required that will have a direct effect and immediate effect uh, on reducing those causes. They will be motivated to help. Next we've got people who care about their direct manager. So the key here is to promote management. Uh, one of the best ways I've found of doing this is setting up uh, continuous training se uh, sessions, you know, 50 minutes or a short talk, where managers actually do a drill down on a given topic. You also use it for um, training them in the different areas of compliance. You train them and use them as your trainers as opposed to using formal trainers. What it does is it builds a, an impressive uh, view of management by their workers. Company culture. Well, this is a great one for uh, risk management because it comes to the heart of uh, risk appetite. So what you need to do is identify both the uh, existing and perceived uh, cultures within the business. Then you need to identify what your desired culture should be and get the staff to buy in by offering them a roadmap. By showing them through the different GRC elements um, of the framework how you can achieve that common goal, whether it be ethical or uh, risk appetite or any other form of company culture. Okay, we then have people's motivations then come into the area of job security and workplace uh, morale. The, the key here is the publicity. So get your marketing people, probably the best people you've got, to work with you in setting up internal communication and feedback channels. With uh, GRC, th there's a lot of statistics that are out there on um, the positive benefits of compliance and risk. And so the other thing is also publicise those, but remember to put them in terms of benefits to the staff. You know, example, um, you know, job security or advancement opportunities through the increase in the size of the business. Don't frame it in terms of company profits. And the other thing is look for better ways than the old traditional newsletter or notice board to publicise this. You've got social media, you've got uh, interactive uh, communication through your, your own internal network these days. The final item on the seek motivation list was salary, number 13. So it's the, uh, the least of your worries. So when you look at it, satisfying the above uh, motivations, uh, you've already covered the areas of risk management, continuous improvement, skills and competency and training, uh, process management, communication and reporting. Now that's all a pretty good start for getting your uh, system implemented. Now all you need is management support. Yes, that's the biggie. Um, so how do we actually get true management support? My belief is the uh, you need to appoint a risk management champion and they can assist you with integrating the uh, your risk management uh, principles and, and culture into the organisation. To do so they really need to be a senior executive and I'm suggesting here a C level but at the senior level because they need to have knowledge of risk management but they also need to have the vision and the drive and the de determination to lead by example and they have to have the authority and responsibility to make things happen. In the early stages of the implementation you use the risk management uh, champion to promote your ERM system into the senior levels of the organisation uh, based on what it can do for the corporate objectives. So these people need to sell your system to your board and executives. Once that's done, you can then move on to implementing it through the rest of the organisation. It's imperative that you gain commitment, not just support from your senior executives. Then the champion's role is to apply pressure across the organisation to that middle level of uh, management to get the cultural change and traction that you need. You know, this includes getting business units to agree to a uniform approach to, uh, to risk, focusing on key strategic risks and objectives, and to assist individual managers uh, with the awareness of how risk management can be applied and how it can guide them in advice to the board and other senior executives. In other words, develop their role. So uh, that's really it. To wrap up, here's what we've learnt. Really, it's all about people. We've got, you know, treating, treating the implementation as a change management issue, ensuring that your project manager is really a people person, 
not outsourcing some of those key activities that um, are vital to its success. Implementing your tasks based on staff motivation and lastly having that C-level executive as a risk champion. So we've discussed all those items today. I hope that you found that of some use. Uh, next week I'll be looking at the best practices. Um, I hope you'll join me for that. Thank you very much and over to you, Fiona. Thank you, Greg. And thanks everyone for joining us today. We'll be answering the questions generated by our audience in a forthcoming blog, so do please check back with us at www.fasttrack365.com for those or to get in touch with Greg Carroll directly. We look forward to Part 3 on September 19th at 10 o'clock Australian Eastern Standard Time, in which we look at the future of risk management in the 21st century, emphasising return on investment. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.